So, uh, welcome to PRL Journal Club. Uh, my name is Rocio Cortez. I'm an associate editor of PRL, and I will be the host of today's event. Um, Today's Journal Club uh, will be on the on the paper excitation spectrum and superfluid gap of an ultracold Fermi gas. This was a paper that was published uh, earlier this year in, in March. And we have here uh, with us several of the authors of the paper that will be dis discussing the paper. And before... Sorry. Before we start, I mean, I would like just to share very briefly something we are very proud about here in PRL is the fact that in the last 11 years, at least one PRL paper has been cited by the Nobel Committee as directly related to the, to the Nobel Prize in physics or chemistry. And I mean, it's a trend that we'll see if it continues uh, also this year. Uh, so you know that if you publish in PRL, you are publishing very good company. And with this, uh, before we start, I would like just to, I mean, I guess at this point, everybody knows how to use Zoom, but just in case, a reminder that please mute yourself and stay muted until you would like to ask a question. Uh, please hold your questions until after the presentation. I mean, you can always uh, post your presentation on the chat of, or your question on the chat. I mean, they will be read uh, afterwards. Uh, and once the presentation is over, feel free with, sorry, to unmute yourself uh, to ask questions if you prefer to, to do it yourself instead of posting it on the chat. Uh, well, first raise your hand and then unmute yourself. And, and with this, I would like just to, to introduce the moderator of today's journal club, which he, uh, who is, I am so sorry about this. Which is a uh, professor Sorad Haji Babik, uh, who is a professor in physics at the University of Cambridge and a fellow of the American Physical Society. Uh, his area of expertise is strongly interacting low dimensional non-equilibrium Bose gases. And before starting his group at Cambridge University, he got his PhD at MIT and was a postdoc at the Col Normal Superior in, in Paris. And with, with this, I will, I will let him start the, the journal club. Thank you. Um, do you hear me? Yeah, it's good. Uh, thank you, Rocio. Uh, so it's, it's a pleasure to, uh, to moderate um, this journal club or very exciting paper. So, so just to briefly introduce the, uh, the, the, the people, uh, before they introduce the science, so this is a this is a combination of experimental and, and theoretical work across uh, uh, three universities: Hamburg, um, Alto, and, and Aarhus. And we have some representatives of, of both uh, the experiments and the and the theory. The experimental uh, work uh, was done at uh, at Hamburg in the in the group of Henning Moritz, uh, who was who has been a professor there now since uh, 2010. And uh, before that, you know, he started off uh, his studies at Heidelberg in Cambridge, and then uh, and then he spent uh, nine years at ETH Zurich, first doing his uh, PhD with uh, with Tilman Esslinger, uh, and then staying on as a, as a first as a postdoc and then as a as a senior uh, researcher. And we have uh, four uh, younger uh, group members uh, from Hamburg. So the, the leading author on on this on this work is actually a PhD student, uh, Hauke Biss, who will, who will give us uh, the talk. Uh, how he studied physics in, in Aachen first and, and then in Hamburg. And uh, where when he first moved there, he did the master's on uh, novel schemes for seeding free electron lasers. And then uh, he switched to the to the many body physics of uh, of quantum gas of fermionic uh, quantum gases uh, with Henning. And uh, we also have uh, Niklas Loic and, and uh, Leonard Sobere present. Uh, they were PhD students at the time when this work was done, but uh, but now they have finished. And, uh, and both of them, uh, I guess with other people, are now still in Hamburg, but doing something else more applied. They're, they're trying to build a quantum computer based on ethereum uh, atoms. And we also have finally uh, uh, Thomas uh, Lompe, who was a postdoc in the group. Uh, he has been uh, known in the field for, for many years. He's worked on various Fermi gases in various places from 2008 to 2021, uh, but now he's moved on to, to Menlo systems where he works on optical frequency columns. 
And on the, on the theory side, uh, we have we have one representative, uh, Yami Kinunen, uh, who is an expert in the in the many body quantum theory of what are called Fermi gases. Uh, Yami got his uh, PhD from University of uh, Yuvaskula in Finland in 2005, and uh, now he's a senior lecturer at the University at Alto University in, uh, in in Finland, also uh, where in the group that was led by by Pai Vitorno. I guess we're missing just one or two experimentalists and, and, Ger and Gerald Brun, who would be the, the Aarhus representative. So uh, without further ado, I guess uh, we give the, the floor to, to Hauke to, give, to tell us about the physics. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Zoran, for the kind introduction. Um, you can all hear me? Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, and I would also like to thank the organizers for inviting us um, to this new exciting format and to be, give us the opportunity to present our work um, in this paper club. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, okay. So my colleagues and I studied in the work I want to present to do you today, the excitation spectrum of fermionic superfluids. And why are we interested in the excitation spectrum? Because it tells us how a system responds to air external perturbations, or more importantly, how stable it is against such perturbations. And this allows us to observe the key feature of superfluidity, the energy gap, which protects the ground state from low-lying excitations. And so hence, in our lab, uh, we cool a gas of fermium lithium to degeneracy, and then we pair the atoms in two hyperfan states. And the fascinating thing is that we can then change the interaction strength between these states, such that they form either deeply bound molecules or loose Cooper pairs. And to measure then the excitation spectrum, we are using Bragg spectroscopy. It uses two beams, which you can see here, which form a lattice, and we drag this lattice to the cloud. And then we see the following excitation spectrum, where we see a linear mode, so this is sound, and we see a continuum. And this continuum is actually gapped. And in this continuum, pairs break apart. Before I will show you these excitation spectra in more detail, um, let me shortly address the question, why is it interesting to study these um, systems? And the answer is superfluidity, um, which is a key many-body um, many phenomena in fluids, such as helium, or more importantly, closely related superconductivity in solids. And here we can build a quantum simulator, which realizes the key Hamiltonian of such a system without any further complications, such as lattice structures, grain boundaries, or impurities. And this allows us also to study, study um, a strongly correlated system where theories challenging and mean field theories do not work. By that, I mean that um, we cannot describe the behavior of one particle by its interaction with the average presence of other particles. For instance, the BCS theory of superconductivity does that, but it's only um, accurate in, for weak interactions. So with ultra good Fermi gases, we can create in our lab a test bed with strong interactions by using the BC-BCS crossover. We can access this crossover by preparing Fermi lithium in two hyperfine states. And if they pair, they form a molecular BC. So we are here on the left. And if we then decrease the attraction between these hyperfine states using a so-called Feshbach resonance, we can transform them into weakly bound Cooper pairs, so into a BCS state. This crossover is parameterized by the inverse scattering length, 1 over KFA. And it's interesting that both a BCS state and a BEC of molecules, both are superfluids below a critical temperature. And in between, we are in this crossover regime where around the unitary point where the interaction parameter becomes zero. And here it's not clear who pairs with whom. So we have a strongly correlated regime. Nevertheless, this is the intriguing part because this is a smooth crossover. This is also a superfluid. So here we ask the question, how does the character of the superfluid changes from a BC to a BCS gas? And we also wanted to find out how well is the superfluid state in this crossover regime protected? And to get these insights, we wanted to measure the excitation spectrum. Um, I've almost forgot, I want to mention that um, this BCBCS crossover, or our work on this BCBCS crossover, builds up on a lot of work from the groups I listed down here. Okay, so what do we expect from um, the, um, in the excitation spectrums? We know that for both limits, a BC of molecules is a 
weakly repulsive phosphor gas, which has the Bergoglio of dispersion. So for a low momentum, we can excite the molecules collectively. So there's a sound mode, typical for a superfluid. And then for large momentum, each individual molecule can receive an energy. So this transforms into a quadratic free particle dispersion. And if we go to even larger energies, we can also break these molecules. So there is a pair breaking continuum. For a PCS state, we expect the following excitation spectrum. There is also a collective mode, so phonons. This is a Goldstone mode. And they are pair breaking excitations. But they're now at lower energy, gapped by two delta, where delta is the superfluid order parameter. Okay, so how could we measure this now in the crossover? Um, first, we prepare for experiment a homogeneous gas trapped in a box system. Box systems have the advantage that compared to a harmonic trap, we probe a system of constant density and that we're pioneered in the Zwierlein group. And our box system, you can see an absorption limit for our box system here from this side. And it's um, formed by a combination of repulsive optical potentials and has the form of a truncated cone with a height of 40 micrometers and diameter of 50 micrometers. And we fill then up with atoms to a density of 0.4 atoms per hyperfin state per cubic micrometer. And then now with that, uh, we have a system. How do we create an excitation at a specific energy and also momentum? We use optical Bragg spectroscopy. It works by shining in two laser beams. And these form a lattice, which you can see on the left. And by changing the angle between both lattice, um, between both laser beams, we can change the periodicity. So you can see that we can tune that. And this defines momentum Q or H bar Q, and the system has to absorb. And similarly, we can also move the lattice by detuning both um, laser beams and frequency. And this defines then the energy H bar omega of the excitations, where omega is the frequency difference between both laser beams. Okay, um, so now we have our setup. Let's start looking at the results for a molecular BEC. On the x-axis, you see that we tuned the momentum by changing the crossing angle. And we tuned here on the y-axis the energy by detuning both laser beams with respect to each other. And then we want to measure if we were able to excite the system. How do we do that? We try to create excitations in the system, and then we let it, we let it thermalize and look at the increase in temperature. And for that, we use the condensate as a thermometer. Um, let me show you that. So for instance, for a region here, where we could not excite the system and it stayed cold, when we do a time of flight measurement to measure the momentum distribution, we see a bimodal distribution with a, with a thermal fraction and a condensate fraction. However, if we go, for instance, here, where we excited the system and heated it up, this condensate fraction is reduced. So at this point, the probability at the given energy h bar omega and momentum h bar q is higher to create an excitation. And this is quantified by the dynamic structure factor s of q and omega. And this is a quantity plotted here in a blue color scale. Um, yeah, exactly. So overall, we, so with that, let's look at the spectrum. We see here a narrow, well-defined mode. It's linear at no, low momentum. So this is actually a superfluid because not quadratic as in a normal gas. And it becomes then a quadratic dispersion. So this is the Bogoli of dispersion I showed you earlier. So what happens now if we go to, um, go to weaker attraction? We then observe the following excitation spectrum. There's still a sound mode, and there is a continuum of excitations in the top right corner. And this continuum, these are pair breaking excitations. If we go further in the crossover, this trend intensifies, and the pair breaking continuum is even more pronounced. And it also appears now at a lower energy. Please note here that the y axis is smaller compared to the central case here. Okay, so zooming out, we see here how a molecular BC transforms into a BCS state. What can we learn now from these spectra? I would like to concentrate on two quantities. Um, the first, and the first, I would like to focus on the collective mode we see here. We see that it bends up on the left because it transforms into a quadratic free particle dispersion. And then at some points, due to the interaction with the continuum, which comes lower and lower, it starts to bend down. And to measure this quantitatively, we zoomed into this region. 
where this change happens. And I would like to discuss this only shortly. We then extract it. So, so we, we zoomed to the measurement in more detail. And we then extracted for each measurement, the, for each momentum, the center of the mode, the collective mode, which are these black points, and then fitted the following expression, which has a term for the speed of sound and a term for the curvature. And going then from a molecular BC on the left here to a BCS system, we see that the speed of sound increases as the gas becomes stiffer because the Pauli pressure is more important on the right. And these measurements agree well with theoretical predictions and also with previous measurements. And at the same time, the lower panel, the curvature flips from positive to negative. And this has important consequences for the allowed damping channels of the of a phononic excitation. So, okay, with this phononic, with this um, very brief look, um, I would like to go back to the full excitation spectra and discuss the extraction of a second quantity, the superfluid gap. So with the result I showed you, we can actually, on the right here, we can already determine the pairing gap by looking here at the onset, because this onset starts at two delta. For the central regime, for this regime, this is not as easy because here, the onset of the pair breaking continuum is actually masked by the collective mode that lies underneath. So we have to think a bit. If we remember how the excitation spectrum should look theoretically, so this plot I showed you earlier, earlier, the pair breaking continuum actually extends to small momenta, but we cannot see it because the coupling decreases. So we wanted to measure at this point here where both the collective mode and the onset are well separated. But we need some way to, to um, increase the probability to create an excitation. And for that, we increase the strength or the intensity of the break lattice. So we measured here along a constant momentum, but with a stronger drive. And the result is that you see the dynamic structure effect over frequency for constant momentum. So this momentum. And we are able to, of course, still to create phononic excitations but this is now power broad. But now due to the higher probability, we can also reveal the onset of the pair breaking continuum. And this allows us also in this regime to extract the pairing gap. So using these two extraction methods, we can extract the pairing gap in the crossover. And we obtain these results where the X axis shows again, the interaction parameter one over KFA. And just to remind you on the left, we have a molecular BC. On the right, we are in the BCS regime. And the y-axis shows then the gap normalized by the Fermi energy. And for our BCS regime here, the gap is smaller, it's still about 20%. So we are in a strongly correlated BCS regime here. And then it becomes larger as we increase the attractive and um, the attractive interactions. And this is intuitive because the pairs are more strongly bound if we go to the left. But here we could ask now, well, isn't this just the binding energy of two particles? And actually it's not. I plotted here also the bare two-body binding energy as a black curve. And you see that it becomes zero at the unitary point. So from here on to the right, two particles without the presence of a Fermi C are not bound. So the, many, the gap we see here is a pure many-body gap. Only the strong interactions create here um, a gap in the excitation spectrum. So this plot is um, the key result of my talk, and we can measure a uh, central property of the BCBCS crossover in a clean model system. Now we can first compare to previous experiments, and we see that they agree perfectly. And then we can compare it as it's a quantum simulation to numerical calculations of this Hamiltonian. And um, let's start, so I added here three curves. Let's start with the red one, which is a mean field calculation. And it describes the behavior, but does not fit to our measured data. But this is expected because we're in a strongly correlated regime. So let's compare it with more advanced calculations. The black curve is a self-consistent T matrix calculation, and it agrees excellent with the data here on the left, but then overestimates our data on the right. Another recent theory, a strong coupling calculations, the blue curve, this calculation also includes particle hole fluctuations in this crossover regime. This one agrees better with the data in the BCS regime, but then below, lies below above our data on the left here. So you see that this is not conclusive, 
However, our measurements provide a tool to calibrate and benchmark here the theory. Okay, after this final comparison, what have I told you? I've shown you how we measure the excitation spectrum of a homogeneous autocode Fermi gas by using Bragg spectroscopy. This reveals then a rich excitation spectrum where we see qualitatively how we go from a molecular BC to a BCS state. We can extract then from these quantities like the um, speed of sound, the bending of the collective mode, or also the pairing gap delta, and use this one to benchmark theories in the strongly correlated regime. And the last point I would, I would note that this work um, in the, for a 3D system lays the groundwork to investigate also the influence of dimensionality and superfluidity. In fact, it's possible to do the same measurement in a 2D Fermi gas, which my coworker Leonard Soberai, who is also in the audience, did recently. And the challenge is then, when we want to compare these, we need a similar interaction parameter, both for 2D and 3D. And using here, for instance, the chemical potential as a common parameter, we found quite surprisingly, when we look at the gaps over in the um, 3D system, the red points and the blue points, are, um, is the data from my coworker. When we compared, um, so plot the gap over the chemical potential, we see quite surprisingly that both curves overlap. And this does not agree with theoretical predictions. It certainly does not agree with mean field predictions. Okay, and with this outlook and teaser of an upcoming paper, I would like to thank you for listening. And I would like to thank my team, which you can see here, and our theory collaborators, Georg Brun from Aarhus and Yami Kinun from Alto. And I would like to thank our funding agencies. So again, thank you for your attention. And I'm curious for your questions. Okay. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Um, I don't see any questions already in the chat. And but I have like five. <laughs> so <Okay. laughs> yeah. and let's start. Um, well, I'm gonna say them all, yeah, quickly, right? And then and then and then we can um, we can pick. They're not all equally interesting, maybe. Uh, so, so one, one, one question we already touched on, but maybe it's worth maybe we could expand more. That this, this experiment is is in three D, uh, but you have done various other things uh, in two D as well, and and I was curious about the comparison there. The second question, we'll just run through them all. Uh, the second, second question is that you said at some point, um, you know, we can do this without the things like the complication of the lattice. But uh, I'm not sure whether the lattice is a complication or, or, or a feature that can en enrich physics, you know, and which can matter, especially like you know, in the in the BCS regime, for example. Right? Uh, we know, but like you know, but, but maybe maybe some other regimes as well. My, my third question is about the temperature. So I mean, you use of course this heating, you know, as um, as a way to. To, to, to see how much energy you have deposited. And, uh, and, and we see that the initial temperature is also not quite zero, but still this fundamentally, you know, from experimentalist point of view, a T equals zero study, right? And so I was wondering like, yeah, what happens if you increase it significantly? You know, for, example, so for example, the fact that here you have, you know, one branch of sound, you know, what would happen if you went somewhere close to, close to TC, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, my first, I can remind you of all these questions afterwards. Uh, you can pick first one. My, my, my fourth question was something that struck me um, when you said like, you know, and here you see how like, you know, the, the fallen branch, you know, bends down due to interaction with the continuum, which is a very visual description of what's on the screen, but I have no idea what it means. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what is, the, what is the physics behind it, the interaction with the, with the continuum is somehow bending it down. And the last question is probably just numerology. Um, which is a you know when, when you show this you know this this dependence of the gap um you know it's a fermi energy right yeah mm -hmm. so the answer might be that this is just a question of convention where we put the tie twos and the pies and the so forth right but uh if i didn't care about those numbers then i would say that the definition of the of the molecular you know regime is that even the simple 
gap, right? Yeah, not the many body gap has to be larger than the Fermi energy because the Fermi energy is defined by the distance, average distance between the atoms, and the and the and the two body binding energy is defined by the size of the molecule, right? So right. if I'm in the regime where, where where I can talk about well-defined molecules, then unless you know we're sloppy with you know four pi squared or something like that, you would think that that automatically means gap has to be you know larger than the than the Fermi energy, the pairing gap. It's just mm -hmm. a molecular binding energy in that case. Mm -hmm. uh, but sorry, you know, you know, that, that that's great. I'll care about my questions for sure. Um, oh, this is fine. Okay, fine. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so uh, there was something in the chat, but I can. Even okay, well, I have written them down, so yeah, we can. Okay, okay, so fine. So, so pick your favorite, and then we'll see where, where we go. Yes. Okay, so. Um... Let's let's start with the bending down. Uh, oh, sorry, I also have a comment. Yeah, Martin did not pioneer box traps. You you Can are you not say a... that again. Yeah, um, Martin, yeah. Did not, Martin did not pioneer box. He did traps. the first one with Fermi, for Fermi yes, gases. Right? Sorry, I forgot probably that. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, yes, I, this qualifier first I have with, to uh, add, yeah. with non fermionic yeah. atoms. We. Uh, Yes, sorry about that. We were obviously inspired by your experiment, Zoran, as much and forgot to mention it here with bosons. <laughs> oh, no, it's fine, it's fine. Anyways, anyways, so yes, I, just because you put it up now. Go ahead, yes, go ahead with the questions. Okay, um, um, you mentioned, so for the down bending, um, so we, what we see here that at some point it starts to bend down. Um, so my intuitive under picture is that there is some interaction um, and then the, when you think about the pairing sorry the pairing continuum as a one level and the collective mode as another level there's some avoided crossing now the question is what is are we have still, are there some other clues why there are interactions and um so far as i know that there are um different damping mechanisms for phonons and so a phonon conference can for instance um, decay into other phonons but they, it can also decay into, or not decay, but scatter with a thermal population of um, populate thermal population of pair breaking excitations. So of these of the quasi particles we observe here also. So there is some channel or some interaction, and this can give uh, then lead to um, the avoided crossing. I'm. Is there yeah. some simple argument why you know? rather than thinking about how, how it approaches why there's an inconsistency if you had you know the formal branch embedded within the continuum you know can can one can one with some physical argument see how it has to be that way because there will be inconsistent to have a continuum and the formal branch running through it mm, i so the, at some point it starts to merge into the um, continuum Yes, um, but I don't know. Maybe if somebody else can add to that, or I don't. May I, may I say something? Yeah, but... just came to my mind a, a, a different kind of picture. <laughs> it may be maybe crap, but uh, I will tell it anyway. So I mean, the, so you we need some kind of coupling between this uh, this phonon, back the Goldstone mode, and the quasi particle. So this is something that we know that. Our theories don't don't include, but we know that there is some coupling. So I mean, okay, it could lead this kind of a avoided crossing type of uh, thing. But uh, the way I would see it is, okay, you have couplings with the quasi particle excitations, which basically increase the mass of your of your gold of your of your Goldstone boson. I mean, a Goldstone mode, mm. and increasing mass because it's basically scattering with the, with everything i mean uh, uh, increasing mass will push down your 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 dispersion mm -hmm. so this would the closer you get come come to this uh, quasi particle continuum the more you will be bending bending down mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. eventually of course your goldstone mode will 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 merge with your continuum and at that point it's it's like hybridized with uh, with the quasi particles i see okay that's one down okay um let's discuss um the fact that um so you mentioned that okay i mentioned here we have a bc of molecules it's the measurement i showed you earlier so let me go back to that 
this one yeah. is at an intersection parameter of 2.45. Mm -hmm. So this is really a molecular VEC. Um, and, and here for these measurements, um, we, this start at an um, interaction parameter of one um, of one over KFA is one equal to 0 0.4. So um, this is still in this crossover regime and the gap is smaller than um, EF. And particularly it's, um, so what we see already that, um, so, sorry. Uh, so it's also when we think about the chemical potential for this point, the chemical potential is positive. So um, there's still a constant onset in the excitation spectrum and then it starts to bend up. Um, only for a point around here, the chemical potential flips and um, becomes negative. Um, so, mm -hmm. yes, it, for, for these points and then to left, it become, became increasingly difficult to um, observe the onset of the pairing gap because as the pairs become smaller, um, become smaller, the onset of the continuum, which we, the onset in momentum. So this onset here, move to the right. So differentiating between the collective mode and the onset, um, this therefore the points end there. Okay. Mm -hmm. and did I answer your question? Well, yeah, but you can measure the gap there. I mean, you can do RS spectroscopy and, and yeah, you can see how it's yeah, exactly. connected. Yeah, you can, you can measure the binding energy. And the, at some point, so what happens, the onset I at showed some point you, the pairing gap is just the, Simple binding energy, right? Exactly, exactly. So for this point, I have not plotted it here. So this onset here is the combined or quadratic added, added um, chemical yeah. potential, which becomes the binding energy and the gap. But in this point, it is just the binding energy here, mm -hmm. um, which which we see here. I think we could we see with state... with RF, yeah. Our method is not perfectly suited to measure the uh, gap in the deep BEC regime because as the pairs become very small, our excitations are larger. I mean, the, the, um, the periodicity is just larger than the pair size and we can't break them apart anymore. So doing yeah. it with our F spectroscopy like what Frank and Martin Zwierland have done is, is, I think, the better path to do that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I can but add it's to it's your... Interesting how far you can push yeah, yeah, yeah. the direction. Yes. Absolutely. So, so the, there's is one small at point, There's not many body effects right on the gap itself, right? You're, even though you have you know superfluidity, right? And then and then this one clearly does is because you know it's not zero at resonance. Uh, so so depending how close you can get, you can see whether they're just heading for each other or you know. Mm -hmm. or yeah, the the unfortunately it doesn't work because the advantage of um, using Bragg spectroscopy is that we are not driving into a third state, and therefore there are no mean field shifts. Um, so because and we stay in the overall many body system. This is not, this is particle conserving. So, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, it, it, we are not coupling so well in the BSC regime, therefore. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if I may, I think one of your questions was about the effect of a lattice. And clearly, I mean, if lattice enriches the physics, I would argue also it would, I mean, this is just a very simple Hamiltonian, even without the lattice. I mean, in the lattice, there's obviously all these questions about a repulsive Hubbard model, but let's 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 not talk about the repulsive Hubbard model here because we want to talk about the BEC BCS crossover. I think one difficulty to study the BEC BCS crossover in a lattice is the one encountered by previous work of um, um, Wolfgang Ketterle in 2006 or five or so, namely that as you come to the strongly interacting regime, the interaction between the molecules becomes so strong. And the pair, you know, these pairs on the sides that you go into a multiband Hubbard model. So in that sense, it's kind of hard to study the BC BCS crossover very cleanly in a lattice, I think, because then it's at least a multiband Hamiltonian, which is hard to hard to solve. Just as one comment, I'm not quite sure where you wanted to go with that question. But it's, but it's, 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 it's practical, no? I mean, if you have a, I mean, how far the bands are separated? Uh, I guess you need some tunneling still, right? So okay, maybe. Yeah, it's hard. So, but, but sort of on, on the resonance, um, there will always be multiband physics. There's no way around that. I mean, no matter how far you um, separate the bands even, which, which is a very rich and interesting regime. It's just not so easy to capture, I think. That's, that's an issue there. And that's a beautiful work, as I said, by Wolfgang Ketterle, I think in 2005 or 2006 by G.T. Chen also. Yeah. Actually, I don't understand it, but maybe I'm not just naive. But, uh, you know, this... this uh... 
I mean, the chemical potential of the of the unitary Fermi gas is smaller than the Fermi energy, right? It is, yes. So if you build, you know, I mean, this whatever birch parameter is, whatever it is. It's, it's a birch parameter. It's about yeah. thirty-seven percent. Yes. yes, yeah, whatever. And, yeah. and so if you build if you build your system in the first place, such that the non-interactive Fermi gas is fully confined to the lowest band. Then the chemical potential. And the unitary gas doesn't have a higher chemical potential than a non-interacting gas. Then why does it spill into other bands? Because the microscopic scattering physics um, is so strong that there, um, how to play, how to say that the coupling to the closed state just occupies higher higher bands. Um, I mean, just if you look at the two-body physics already, right? Then two two particle scattering at unitarity occupy. Near, a large manifold of bands. Perhaps there's a clear way of saying that, but it doesn't have to do with the two, with the many body physics or the chemical potential, just with two body scattering physics. I see. Okay. And the last question I think you asked was about, and what happens if we go to TC? Um, so I'm, so I can only say something about these um, damping. So what, um, for instance, Martin Zwillan observed is that the damping is not so that the, that it becomes quadratic, so that the damping or the width of the mode scales quadratic with um, with the momentum, because I think the, um, you it's getting hydrodynamic, and um, in our regime we check that we, um, this, this is compatible. Also, as he measured below TC, um, it's linear, um, but yeah, maybe the others can add to that. Um... I mean, I can definitely say that part of the part of the problem with going to C is that the metric that we measure, like yeah. how, how we determine our dynamic structure yeah. factors, essentially related to measuring heating rates for which we use yeah. a change in the condensate fraction, which where there's less and less signal as we get closer and closer to TC, which made these measurements fairly tricky. We've we've played around with it in the mm -hmm. past and you can can study some things. We've seen small changes in the speed of sound with changing temperature. We've seen the change in the damping of the sound mode and so on. But those measurements are overall fairly painful, which is why we didn't go much further there because the mm -hmm. higher temperature just makes everything go, uh, you know, less signal to noise and less knowledge about what you're doing essentially. Yeah, so somebody, asked, somebody asked a question, but just a comment on that. I mean, sure the condensed fraction is smaller close to TC, but the other hand, you know, the dependence of condensed fraction on temperature is steeper, which actually, yeah. Yes, it's, it's more that, well, it, yes. It makes smaller it, things, right? Yeah. Yes, as, as long as we're still below TC, it's it's still doable, even, even as you go above TC, actually, because if you're just looking at the occupation of low momentum mode, that still goes down, but it just, it, it's no longer very sensitive. And it's also just a purely a signal to noise kind of thing where ultimately the, um, like if, if, if you measure the, 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 the actual density that you're recording your images becomes lower and lower. So while it still scales pretty well, your signal to noise ratio still becomes worse. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. We have a question from, from Martin Rodriguez Vega. Martin, I don't see you. Do you want to unmute yourself? I can read your question also, if you tell me to. Um, but do you want to ask the question yourself? I don't see him. He asks you to read it. No, noisy here. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Also, also, also in writing, not just sound. Um, so, 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 Martin says thanks for a nice talk, for the nice talk. And the, and the question is, um, I just read without processing it myself yet. It says, uh, uh, is the phonon branch gapped in the BCS regime? Uh huh. I see uh, what I see. What he means, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. It's yeah. It's um. So for neutral neutral um fermions or yeah exactly the phonon gap or the yeah the Goldstone mode is is ungapped. So there's an ungapped Goldstone mode. So this arises due to um. So at the beginning we have a um, spontaneous breaking and symmetry breaking. So there's a, the gap parameter and the fluctuations. When you think about the Mexican head potential of them, the BCS state, the fluctuations in the valley of the Mexican head potential. So the phase fluctuations, this is then manifested manifest in the Goldstone mode. Maybe um, he's thinking about 
um, superconductors. Uh, and there, this... I think, I think he's referring to the graph. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Then I'm... Okay. The, the graph is not starting at zero momentum. The thing is, so why are we limited there? Um, small for small momentum, we need to... So in the end, we, we, we scale the... We change the crossing angle of the lattice. And this defines momentum. And for... The large momentum, this is the largest crossing angle. So this is the area limited by the aperture of our microscope objective, where we send both beams in and then they are crossed. And for the lowest point, we are limited by the minimal distance. And we use for that two mirrors. And this is just the minimal distance we can place both mirrors next to each other. So this is then the smallest, um, smallest momentum. And this is about is at 0.25 um, kF. So therefore, it's not going to zero. But if you would extend it and fit it, then, it's, um, um, then, then it goes to zero. I mean, another thing is that uh, at our longest wavelengths, we only have like three or two um, waves oh. actually that still fit into our box. So yeah, we are reaching multiple limits uh, at that point. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, so the limit is limit of a box system. This is... Um, an, earlier paper we did is measuring sound in a, in a box, in a rectangular box, is really the mode, which is the, the lowest mode is the one where the density is changing, flipping between left and right. So this is then really the lowest phononic mode. So probably, so at a finite system, Q of zero is, is not possible. And so as you increase Q, I mean, is, do you always go into such steps that you, always, that you add half a valent? The number of valent increases by half? Mm. This, uh, the, increased Q, the increased Q, the increased Q. So Thomas said, like, yeah, we have say whatever two periods inside the box, right? Is the first one two periods? Is the second one two and a half? Is the third one three? Or is it no, not dimensional? No, it's um, it's continuously. Can we we can move it kind of continuously with stepper motors? We can move the um, both beams or the distance between both beams. So um, I know, I know, but overall, the overall, sorry. But it's not in the, it's not an eigenstate. I mean, it's not the, it's not an excitation if if it's not commensurate. I mean, it's a round trap anyway, right? So yeah, exactly. Uh, yes. Ah, yes. So yeah. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so I think we are we are we are hopeful that yeah, with uh, with that. like three waves, we are already in the limit of uh, an infinite box. <laughs> exactly hitting everything. <laughs> yes, yes. At least that's uh, our assumption. Apparently, Landau said that the smallest integer number much larger than one is three. No, we're good. <laughs> or maybe he meant the smallest, you know, the, the, the largest number, much more than one is a third, whatever. The, you know, if he was doing some expansion, a small parameter. But either way, you know, three is good. Okay. No, sorry, yes, that, that's that's irrelevant, given it's a, it's a, it's a circle anyway. Um I don't see okay, we're 45 minutes into it already. I don't see further questions in the chat so should, should we now do like a reverse thing where i pass on to to rossio and then rossio passes on to stan or something to go, to go backwards um so thank thank you very much uh Alke, mainly for the presentation but also to everyone else for for participating um and helping with the answers and uh, and i pass it back to to rossio Rusty, it's you. You've muted. Uh, well, uh, so thank you very much all for participating in this journal club, in particular to our moderator and all the authors who have been here with us participating, and also to everybody who has joined this journal club. Um, this event has been recorded, so I will share on the chat where you can find the recording as well as other as well as information of other journal clubs or the physical review journals, in case you are interested. Uh, and we are trying to do this every month. So the next journal club will hopefully be in June and will be, will be announced very soon. So just keep an eye if you are interested. And, mm. and with that, I would just like to thank you all again. And thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.